Direct us, O Lord God, in all our doings with your continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name. And finally, by your mercy, bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. At this first reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning at verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I'm commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land you are crossing in the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live loving the Lord your God and obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give you, to give your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 1. We will read the verses responsibly. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither, Everything they do shall prosper. Therefore, the, the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. The second reading is Philemon chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy to our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward Lord Jesus. I pray the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you and do your duty. Yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he's indeed useful to both you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent, in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. 
I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We don't hate. Well, at least we try not to. Sure, we may occasionally say we hate something, I sometimes catch myself saying things like, I hate mosquitoes, or I hate traffic on I-77, or I hate it when people randomly leave out their shopping carts in the middle of parking lots, or I hate potato salad, I hate winters that last for seven months, (laughs) I hate slow internet. While I say I hate these various things, I don't believe I truly hate them. It's mostly a lack of creativity on my part to find other words that more adequately describe how I'm feeling. I can, however, say with absolute certainty that I hate bullying, I hate cancer, I hate that we live in a world where one out of five people don't have enough food every day, I hate how our hate-filled speech and groups are growing in our country. In these instances, it's okay to hate because, as the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, we are to hate what is evil. And these things I just listed are all evil in some form. So the act of hating them is appropriate. Evil options aside, we Christians strive to avoid hating. There are various reasons behind this practice, but the overwhelming factor for us to distance ourselves from hate is because of that guy named Jesus. If Jesus had one prevailing message throughout his ministry, it was for us to love, not to hate. 
Hate was and is the catalyst behind so many of the divisions and conflicts that Jesus was trying to heal and remove. Yes, Jesus' Jesus's command was to love, to love all people, people who annoy us, people who are different from us in every way possible, even the people who have wronged us in life. Jesus calls us to love them. There are no exceptions to Jesus' command. Which, of course, is what makes today's gospel passage so bizarre. Jesus seems to pull a complete 180 on us as he says that following him will lead to hate. In case you're wondering, there isn't anything mixed up with that translation. The Greek word that is in the original text means hate. And Jesus isn't telling us to hate what is evil like Paul does. No, Jesus talks about hating our very own families. Why would Jesus say something that is so seemingly contradictory to his core teachings? From a pure historical context, it makes some sense when we consider the personal implications for those early converts to Christianity. To follow Jesus, at times, meant complete excommunication from one's family and community. Because to become a Christian would mean a rejection of whatever faith a person's family likely held. In a situation such as that, we can start to see how some hate might result from such a schism. For us modern hearers, is this text and the language that Jesus uses still applicable? I mean, sure, walking in the way of the cross isn't going to be all rainbows and butterflies, but how exactly does following Jesus and sharing God's abundant love with others cost us and our family so much that hate might result from it. I admit, I was a skeptic of this teaching until I came across the following story from a beloved college professor of mine, Dr. Jacqueline Bussey, who just so happens to be an alum of Davidson College. The excerpt that I'm going to share is from Dr. Bussey's most recent book, Love Without Limits. Here's what Dr. Bussey says. I have an acquaintance whose husband died on 9-11, a firefighter. He went into the second tower after the first had already collapsed. His loved ones assume he was probably, he probably knew he wouldn't make it out alive. Still, he went in. To the world, he was nothing but a hero But for his wife, who had a new baby at home, things were more complicated. At the head level, she knew he was a hero and that what he did was the most loving, generous thing anyone could ever do for someone else. This huge heartedness was, after all, one of the reasons she had fallen in love with him. But at the heart level, She struggled something fierce. Her husband had made a choice, and the choice was not her or their baby son. While she would not have used the word hate to describe what this felt like, some small part of her, not the whole, just a part, struggled against the feeling that her husband had loved those strangers more than he loved his own family. And that was extremely painful for her. For me, this story brought some much needed insight to today's gospel. My previous tendency with this text was to try to soften Jesus' language 
put it in its historical context, and move right along. Dr. Bussey's acquaintance changed that. While it is ex an extreme and far from a typical situation, the story does bring to light the tension of emotions we and our families can have when we follow Jesus and love the way that Jesus calls us to love. One doesn't have to sacrifice his or her entire life for this to be true. If we try to follow Christ, and if we try to love in the ways that God calls us to, our bank accounts will be smaller, our schedules will be fuller, and our energy levels will be less than they otherwise would have been. Such minor sacrifices are a part of the kind of abundant love of Christ that we're called to. And if we're loving rightly, there will be an impact on us as well as an impact on our families. Perhaps you feel like this is no big deal. Perhaps everyone in your family is all good and completely buys into this life of faith that we're on. At some point, though, if you are loving abundantly out in God's big family, there will be a sting within your personal family and friends. There will be friction. There will be frustration. Perhaps there will even be some level of hate if that's what you or they want to call it. Because instead of you sharing more of your financial resources or your time or your energy or your love with all of those other people, they're going to want you to give more of that to them. Which is a completely natural emotion to feel. Don't feel guilty about that. Just realize that's a part that comes with living in God's big family. The love we have been given, it needs to be shared. That's how it spreads and multiplies. And while there is always more than enough love to go around, there will be times when we desire more love from the people we're closest to. When you find yourself in such moments, let your loved ones know how you're feeling. Good boundaries, self-care, and focusing on our individual families are also a part of the life of faith. It's just we're simultaneously called to live a life that's bigger than us, a life bigger than our immediate family trees. It's a life that comes from sacrifice, and Jesus wants us to understand that and to hear how hard that can be. With all of this talk of cost and sacrifice, it can make us lose sense of the wonderful things that can be experienced when we follow Jesus. Because although walking in the way of the cross means encountering the pain and death of Good Fridays, when we love without limits, we can also readily see the beautiful realities of new, resurrected life. And when we get those glimpses and we feel God's presence at work in this world, why? That's also when we most clearly experience what this life is all about. Now, as we go about living this life, there will be times and occasions to hate. And I'm not just talking about that bad traffic and mosquito kind of hate. It is those evil times, those instances where hate can be appropriate. The predominant emotion and action for us as Christians, however, is to love. That is our greatest command. And it is a command that most certainly includes loving our nuclear families too. 
The command just goes well beyond who our biology says our relatives are. What exactly such love will cost us and those closest to us, it's hard to say. But there will be a cost. For Jesus, his free, abundant love cost him everything. And yet, look at what was gained. May we be so bold to try to love more like that. Amen.